So last week, we talked, uh, we started, uh, we broke into Genesis chapter number nine, and Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives steps off the ark, and we discuss what it is that God felt uh, important enough to be the first things that he tells Noah when they get off the ark. We talked about the issue of, of uh, the, the, the death penalty, that if a man takes another man's life, that they're to be put to death, and the authority that that then gives for man to govern man. And so before you can have a nation on this earth, which is what we're going to find in Genesis chapter number 10, you first have to have the authority in order to govern that nation. And so we find the authority being given in Genesis chapter number 9. And, uh, and, and what we're going to find is uh, Noah and his sons and their descendants are going to be spelled out in Genesis chapter number 10. Um, but before we get there, I want to take a, a bit of a, um, a sidestep tonight away from the topic of, of governmental authority and the nations and what's going to happen in Genesis chapter number 11 to key in specifically on one specific item in Genesis chapter number 9. And so in order to do that, let's uh, begin reading in Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 18. Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 18. It says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now, one might think that's a particularly some, some odd things are going on here, right? And uh, what I want to pose to you and what I hope that you understand when we get done tonight is the verses that we just read are pretty important for you to understand some of the context for what happens not only later in Genesis, but also throughout the Old Testament and up until the time of Christ. But in order to understand that, let's first, let me pose some questions and, and let's, let's dissect a few things here. Now, when it says that um, uh, in verse number 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without, there's an issue here where Ham sees the nakedness of his father, his father awakes, knows that something was done, and he curses Canaan. Now, what does it mean when Ham saw the nakedness of his father? Some thinks, and, and by the way, I'll just say this in case you're listening on the live stream or we don't have any kids in the sanctuary here, but we'll be using some more adult terms in the Bible study tonight that may not be appropriate for little ears. Not, not, not anything vulgar, but you know, terminology from, from the scripture. So if you have little ears that are listening, tonight's, tonight's uh, content is a bit more uh, mature. So some, when it says the, the nakedness of his father, some think that this is the issue of sodomy. That, um, that, that Noah got drunk, and that it says that Ham saw the nakedness of his father, and then Noah wakes from his sleep and knows what his son had done, and he curses Canaan. Um, and so one of the reasons why they think that it's sodomy is because when Noah awoke, he knew what his son had done. So they're saying this is, an issue, this is a homosexual act, this is sodomy, that Noah knew that something was done to him. Um, and that's one of the reasons they say that. Another reason they say that is they're combining the first point with, with taking the nakedness of his father literally. And I'm a good proponent of literal Bible study, but I want to show you tonight why, um, what, that, what that saying actually means. 
So um, by saying that he saw the nakedness of his father, just in the context of this, if you think, if that's a woodenly literal statement, that Ham sees the nakedness of his father and does something to his father. So some people think that that's sodomy. But I want to pose another question to you. Let's say that was true. Why would God curse Canaan? Why would God curse his, uh, Noah's grandson? Um, some say, because obviously if it was a homosexual act, it's not going to bear any offspring, right? So why curse Canaan? Some say it's because earlier on in Genesis chapter number nine, God had already blessed Noah and his sons. And since Ham had received a blessing, Ham could, uh, Noah couldn't curse Ham, so he cursed Canaan. Um, I, I don't find that to be compelling. Um, I don't even think that it, that it makes much, much sense. Um, why would Noah curse Canaan for something that Canaan had nothing to do with? Ham uncovered his, Noah's nakedness, so Noah cursed Canaan. Does that seem just? And uh, some who reject God and is, it would criticize the Word of God and this passage as being unjust and arbitrary, that there's an arbitrary cursing of Canaan for something that Ham did. But uh, people are told not only is the Bible not true, but then they start to question the literal six days of creation. They start to question the flood. They, they question Adam and Eve being in the garden, that Satan being in the garden. And not only that, but they say, well, look at this unjust curse. Why is Canaan cursed? He didn't do anything, you know. It was, it was his father. So I, I think a proper understanding of the text will not only provide the reason for a just curse, but also adds veracity to the efficacy of God's Word and to the, the story of the Bible as it's unfolding here in the book of Genesis. By the way, our God is not arbitrary. Neither is His Word. So um, there are several reasons why this is not sodomy. First of all, that doesn't fit all of the details of the circumstances here. Uh, second, um, like I said, I'm a big proponent of literal Bible study, but this phrase of uncovering his father's nakedness, we'll see is a phrase that's used to define something else, somewhat of a figure of speech. And uh, they would say the reason that Cain is, uh, uh, um, well, the, the issue of sodomy there, the, the issue of the nakedness of his father has to do definitely with sexual immorality, but the issue is not homosexuality or sodomy. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to get Leviticus chapter number 20. Leviticus chapter number 20. Leviticus gives law and instruction, and Leviticus chapter number 20 gives instruction on sexual immorality. And one of the things that idolatry is likened to is uh, idolatry. So like in, in verse number five of Leviticus chapter number 20, it says, I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among the people. So Molech was an idol and the people are going out and committing idolatry and that's likened to, you know, you know sexual sin, adultery. Um, chapter number 20 also deals with the, the sexual sin of adultery itself uh, explicitly in verse number 10. It says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. Now the reason I'm pointing this out is I want you to see the context of Leviticus 20 is dealing with sexual sin. I want you to understand where this is coming from. Now, the uncovering of the nakedness is a figure of speech for sexual immorality. Um, <clears throat> if you uncover someone's nakedness, that term is not saying that you're looking at someone without their clothes on. That's not what that, that saying means. What it means is it's a modest way for the Bible to describe two people committing an intimate, sexually immoral act. You know how the Bible talks about, and Moses under the law will say that a man shall not lie with another man. You know, they use a term like lie with them. Well, if you were to take that woodenly literal, you know, you can't lay down next to each other. You, you know, there's, there's different terms used in the Bible to be a bit more, um, a, or I mean, a bit less vulgar. 
Okay? Now, Leviticus chapter 20, look at verse number 19. It says, and, and thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin. They shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. Notice what that says there. If you lie with your uncle's wife, you have uncovered who? Not, not your uncle's wife naked, nakedness, but your uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, they shall die childless, and if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. So if you take your brother's wife and you have relations, intimate relations with her, you have uncovered your brother's nakedness. So the, 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 the issue here, in, in the law, Moses says, if a man lies with mankind, it's an abomination. In Genesis chapter number four, when it talks about um, Adam and Eve coming together as a husband and wife, how does, it, how does it say what Adam and Eve did? It says that Adam knew his wife, right? So the Bible uses less vulgar, vulgar terms than our current vernacular that says the two people had, had sex, right? So it's, 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 less, it's, it's less vulgar. Um, so don't miss the meaning just because Genesis chapter number nine says that it uncovered his father's nakedness, that somehow this is not some, that you're taking this phrase woodenly literal. So um, God's word is more refined than that. And, and it's, it's, it's more sophisticated than our modern vernacular. So don't let that mess us up. So uh, look at chapter number 18 of Levit Leviticus. So we've, what we're seeing here is that the man's nakedness is, is his wife's nakedness. And in Leviticus chapter number 18, look at verse number 6. It says, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness, I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover, she is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover, it is thy father's nakedness. So let's just be real clear here. What is uncovering the father's nakedness? It's your father's wife, is what that just said. It's having relations with your father's wife. Now, we're gonna go through some more verses just to lay the foundation, but if you just take Leviticus chapter number 18 and verse number eight, it's telling you that when Ham uncovered Noah's nakedness, his father's nakedness, what that's telling you is, Ham had an intimate relation with his mother. His father's nakedness is his father's wife. Now, I want to read a few more ver verses because I don't want, I'm not going to just base it off of one. I want you to see the context here and I want you to see some other things that are kind of fascinating. Uh, back to, you're in Leviticus 18, look at verse number nine. Um, I just want to, we're going to read some verses here several verses, just so you see that phrase, the nakedness of, and understand what it's referring to. Leviticus chapter 18, verse number nine. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy, thy son's daughter, or of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness. Now, just to be clear here, I want to reiterate, what we're talking about is sexual immorality. We're not talking about looking at someone who is unclothed, okay? Verse number 11, the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife, she is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law, she is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is who? Thy brother's 
nakedness. So the wife is the man's nakedness. Does that make sense? Now, th that, that issue there is, again, about sexual immorality. Look at Habakkuk chapter number 2 and get Ezekiel 22 on your way there. Get Ezekiel 22 and Habakkuk uh, 2. Habakkuk chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Habakkuk 2.15. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk also, that thou may look on their nakedness. What God is warning about here is he's talking about men that is getting their neighbor drunk so that he, they can uh, seduce and have their neighbor's wife. God says, don't do that. Ezekiel chapter number 22, I asked you to get that. Are you there? I see some flipping. I'll give you a second. Ezekiel chapter number 22, verse number 6. It says, Behold the princes of evil. Uh, evil. <laughs> Behold the princes of Israel. <laughs> well, you can, we can kind of interchange those words sometimes. <laughs> Behold the princes of Israel. Every one were in thee to their power to shed blood. In thee have they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dwelt, dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised mine holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood. So God's pointing out the wickedness here of Israel, right? Um, and in thee they eat upon the mountains. In the midst of thee they commit lewdness. So there's lewdness going on in Israel. There is immorality. And it says in verse number 10, right after it's talking about committing lewdness, it says, In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. What they're doing is this, is this is immorality, this is incest. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife, there's Habakkuk, and another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law, remember what Leviticus said, don't uncover thy son's nakedness, that's your daughter-in-law. And another in thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. So this is, this is not about Israel looking at people without clothes on. This is immorality that's going on. By the way, that's also true for Paul's case, right? Because over in the book of 1 Corinthians, what do we find in the New Testament? <laughs> just in case you thought that was just Israel who could be that lewd. You have Paul who says, there's someone who's committing fornication in you, such that is not named, you know, out, outside of there, that they are, they have their, their mother's wife. 1 Corinthians chapter number, number 5, that it's, common, it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not met much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And, and you hear that and you're like, that's, that's not good. That's really bad, right? <laughs> and so this, this issue continues to go on. So now I want you to be very clear. I want you to be very clear. Go back to Leviticus chapter number 20 now. I already pointed out one verse to you that I think is very clear. In Leviticus chapter number 18, I want to give you another verse that is extremely explicit now that you have the context of what that phrase means. Leviticus chapter number 20, and look at verse number 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So what's going on here is uncovering your father's nakedness is a, is a Hebrew figure of speech that to say that Ham had relations with his mother, from which the offspring is Canaan. And when, when two are married, what does Paul say in Ephesians? 
When two are married, the two become one flesh, right? So if you're uncovering your father's nakedness, the two are one. That's why, can you understand the, the phrase now of why that would be uncovering your father's nakedness? The two are one flesh. The wife is the father's flesh. You are uncovering your father's nakedness. So the two are become one, and it makes perfect sense there. Therefore, Canaan was a product of incest. And Noah cursed Canaan because his son had relations with his wife, and his wife became pregnant and, uh, and had a son. And this story in Genesis chapter number 9, why, why even have it there? Obviously, this stuff was going on in Israel later on. We don't find specific mentions of it later on in Israel. We, ha we find it being forbidden in the law. Why is this story here in Genesis chapter number 9 after they get off the boat? It's because it keeps emphasizing Canaan and telling you where Canaan and the Canaanites came from. And if you know anything about the Canaanites, who are they in comparison to Israel? They're like arch nemesis, right? And so we know where Canaan comes from. One detail the scripture does not feel that we need to know is what about Noah's wife? I wonder, you know, I, I just put this in my notes because I wonder, was Noah's wife drunk as, as well as Noah? And the son, you know, took advantage of her? We don't know, but what we do know is that Ham appears to be a very wicked person. Because when Ham goes in there and commits this act, when he comes out, what does he do? He tells his brothers. You know, someone who's ashamed of what they do, they tend to try to keep their sin in secret, don't they? Ham comes out, he's, he seems to be, what I think is going on is he is brazen about his sin. And he comes out and tells his brothers, and it's his brothers who have to try to start resolving the problem by coming in and putting the, 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 the blanket over their the covering over their mother. All right, so back to Genesis chapter number 9, and I now want to reread the passage with the understanding that we now have. And let's, so let's go back to Genesis chapter number 9. Verse number, Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 18. Genesis 9, 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Why is there an emphasis that Ham is the father of Canaan in this verse? You know, Noah has many other grandsons. When you turn over to Genesis chapter number 10 and we start talking about the nations and the descendants of Shem and Ham and Japheth, what you're going to find out is that they all have sons. And Ham has more sons than Canaan. <laughs> Why the specific instance, in, uh, 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 insistence here on Canaan? I think that's because the relationship that Ham had with Noah's wife bore another son, but the scripture makes clear to say that Canaan, that Ham was the father of Canaan and not Noah. And so when you read through Genesis chapter number nine, you know what you're gonna read over and over again? Ham, who is the father of Canaan. Ham, who is the father of Canaan. Why are we even bringing up Canaan here? Because the central part of this story of Ham uncovering his father's nakedness is the offspring of Canaan. That's why. Verse number 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. So Noah becoming drunk meant that he was not functioning as the proper head for his wife, as the proper covering to be able to protect his wife and his family. So you shouldn't be a drunkard. Verse number 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, let's just throw him in there again, because the, the point that I raised there is if this is a act of sodomy between Ham and Noah, why is Canaan involved in this story? It's just one more point that fix, fits all the facts, is what I'm trying to show you. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, 
and told his two brethren without. So um, the Canaanites will never be able to claim that their father is Noah because the scripture over and over again says that Ham is the father of Canaan. And so when Ham saw the nakedness, it's, a, it's an incestuous offspring. And, and then he goes out and he tells his brothers, and it's his brothers who's starting to put things together. Verse 23, And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their, their, sho- their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So what we find here, Shem and Japheth have integrity in this matter. Not only are they covering up their mother, but when they cover it up, they're, walking, they're not looking upon it. They're acting in integrity. Ham, no integrity. Verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So Noah knows what happens, happened, either from his wife or from Japheth or, or from Shem. And the curse on Canaan would have either been in the womb or, or when he was born, regardless. It was when the fruit came from this incestuous relationship, Noah said, cursed be Canaan. And he cursed Canaan, not because Ham had done something to him, and he arbitrarily picks one of his grandsons out and says, I think I'll curse Canaan. No, he cursed Canaan because Canaan was the byproduct of of incest. You know, we used to have a stigma against things like that. We used to have a stigma for for children being born out of wedlock. And we had that stigma in order to stifle sinful behavior. Noah cursed Canaan because there should be a stigma against sin and the offspring of sin. Now, some people say, well, that's not nice. That child didn't have any choice in being the offspring. No, I understand that. But the stigma prevents other children from having to go through that as well. Uh, that, that's a whole other issue. Maybe you, and, and, and we could talk about that in more detail. But, uh, um, <clears throat> the fact that Ham is the father of Canaan, and it repeats that phrase over and over again, is directly applicable to the context of the verses here. And that tells you what the act was, why, what's going on here. Verse 18 identifies Noah's sons. It lists Shem, it lists Ham, and it lists Japheth, but it also lists Canaan. So then I say, Ham had three other sons. You go over to Genesis chapter number 10, you see that he begat Cush, and Mizram, and Put. And so Canaan's just one of the other sons. What's so special about Canaan? Well, hopefully, I, I hope that you know that now. Um, so Canaan is cursed because of, of, of what he is a, a product of. Now, I want to talk to you about the legacy impacts of that sin. What I mean is that there are long-lasting effects of sin. Would you agree with that? If a man commits sin, let's say, let's, let's keep it on the, the issue of immorality here of the sexual sins. If they commit adultery, is there not consequences for that? Does it not break up homes and families and, 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 and children are, are, are um, they, they suffer because of these things? The sins of the parents impact the children. And so as a society, I mentioned that we have tried to remove those social stigmas. You know what, they, didn't they have a book called The Scarlet Letter? I, I remember reading it in, in junior high or something, but now I, I can't remember if it was. The point being is that we used to have social stigmas because the, we were trying to protect the family, the marriage, the individual and not to encourage sinful behavior. And what society has done has made sin acceptable. Not only have they made it acceptable, they've brought it into your house and free advertising and put it in front of your TV. Gross immorality there just by clicking on the the television. And it used to be that you had to pay to watch gross immorality on your television. 
Now you just turn to Fox, CBS, ABC, you turn on the Grammys, and what you'll find is the lewdest of all behavior. Society has done away with stigmas. Making it easy on someone to sin or removing the reproach of sin seems to be more compassionate to some. But in reality, it breeds more sin and more pain and more suffering. Do you understand? Uh, did, did you catch what I just said? Um, I've used this example before, but when the government comes along and pays a, a woman to have more children out of wedlock and give them more government assistance, there are people, and I hope that they're not Christians, <laughs> there are people that think that it's compassionate to give money for those types of, of actions. But what does that do? That takes away the woman's dependence upon a man to take care of the family and the child. And it, it encourages the woman to go ahead and be taken advantage of some more. And not only is it hurtful for the woman, it's hurtful for the man because he's not being responsible. And it's hurtful for the children that come out of that situation because now you have children who are growing up without fathers. So that institution that God created back in the beginning with the individual and the, the volition of man, and we'll talk about this some next week, and then you have a marriage where the man is accountable to the wife and you have this, this union, and then you have a family where now the man is responsible for a children. And, you know, as a father, and I think any father can, 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 pretty much most fathers will attest to this, when you hold that child for the first time and you realize, I'm responsible for taking care of this little package, it's life-changing. So then you have the responsibility of the family, and then you have the responsibility of the nation. And then the nation is under God. So, the cursing of Canaan is a stigma against sexual immorality. It's not arbitrary, and it's not unjust. It's wise. It's wise. By the way, that government policy that we talked about, you know what the rate is for you, you know, um, um, African-American children born outside of wedlock? Last I looked, it was 70%. I think for, you know, like an Anglo-Saxon white person, I think the rate is something like 30%. And these numbers could be wrong by now. These could have been, you know, old. You know what the rate is in Japan? 1%. Why is that? You think that social stigmas don't have an impact on the immorality that goes on in the culture? You don't think that cultures can impact the sin? How many of us would even deem Japan to be a Christian nation? Leviticus chapter number 20. The legacy impacts of the curse. So now there's a curse on Canaan. Why is this important? Why is this important? It's important because the issue of the Canaanites continue throughout history and become a thorn in Israel's side. Look at Leviticus chapter number 20, look at verse number 22. Remember, we just got done reading about what the nakedness of the father was in Leviticus chapter number 20. I want you to look at the verses that come right after it. So we read verse number, uh, um, um, well, we read 20 and 21. Look at verse number 22. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation. Notice that singular. You're not going to walk in the manner of the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from the people. Notice what he says there. 
the people who were uncovering their father's nakedness is the people that are in the land that God's going to send Israel to dispossess. Whose land is it that Israel's going to dispossess? Genesis chapter number 10. We were in Genesis chapter number 9, right? What happens in Genesis chapter number 10? The issue of the nations. Genesis chapter number 10. Look at verse number 19. And the border of the Canaanites, that's who we're talking about, right? The border, Genesis 10, 19, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, Sidon as thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adam, uh, Adma and Zeboim and even unto Lasha. So it's from Sidon, which is on the north coast of the Mediterranean Sea, all the way down to Gaza, which you're familiar with today because Israel has some problems with some enemies in that land, don't they? And then it goes over to Sodom and to, to Gomorrah. What is this land? This is the same land that God gave to Israel, is it not? God said, the land that I'm going to give to you is inhabited by who? The Canaanites. Chapter number 11. Look at verse number 31. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. You ever heard a song? You used to hear it down in the Primitive Baptist Church in Kentucky. Canaan land, I'm longing for you. Have you ever heard that song? People longing for Canaan land. That's the land that Israel was promised, was Canaan, the son of Ham, Canaan land. Look at chapter number, uh, chapter number 13, verse number 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Look at chapter number 17, verse number 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. So God is making a covenant with Abram, Abraham. And he says unto you, I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to make of you a great seed. And what land is it that he's giving, giving to, to, to Abraham? All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Chapter number 24, Genesis 24, look at verse number 37. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. So their father, you know, he said, You're not going to take a son from among these Canaanites. You're going to go over to, to this other land and take a son. Look at chapter number 31. It's chapter number 37, verse 1. Genesis chapter number 37, verse 1. It says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan, over and over and over again. By my calculation, there's about 39 references in the book of Genesis alone to Canaan land, the land of Canaan. Why? God says, that's the land that you'll have. Now, I think you probably knew that already, but did you notice when we read back in Leviticus chapter number 20, when we just, just now, just a few moments ago, and we read that verse, and God said that all of the people that are in that nation that I'm going to have you get out of the land when you go into it, those people who were in that land have done all of these things, the uncovering of their father's nakedness. Those Canaanites are doing this sexual immorality, and I'm going to have you go in and kick them out of the land. So the very people who uncovered their father's nakedness, that's the Canaanites. Get Psalm 105. Psalm 105 and Matthew chapter number 15. Psalm 105 and Matthew 15. Psalm 105, verse number 7. Psalm 105, 7. 
It says, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham. Verse 11, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. <laughs> Cursed be Canaan. Canaan goes in and dwells in the land. God says, Israel, I'm giving you that land. I want you to go in and I want you to wipe them out because of their lewdness, because they're committing all of these things that are an abomination to me. It seems that Canaan was a product of an incestuous relationship and had problems with sexual immorality. Now, also, you know, over in Joshua, it talks about when Israel's going in to inherit the land, they're going in to inherit the land of Canaan. All throughout your Old Testament, you read the land of Canaan, now you know where it's coming from. Cursed be Canaan. Now, when Satan, so Canaan is in the land, right? And there are wicked people. God wants Israel to remove them. And when Satan puts giants in the land, this is, if you remember, Israel comes up out of Egypt and they go in to possess the land and they're but grasshoppers. You remember that? And when Satan puts those giants in the land to try to subvert the plans and the purposes of God, where did Satan plant the giants? In Canaan's land. Satan used the product of incest that which is an abomination to God, to try to subvert God. Satan, Satan loves the enemies of his enemy and works with them. Now I ask you to get Matthew chapter number 15. God tells Israel to wipe out the Canaanites. And if Israel would have listened to God, if you listen to God, do things tend to wind up to be better for you or not as good? So God tells Israel to wipe out the Canaanites, but did Israel did do what God told them to do? Matthew chapter number 15, look at verse number 21. Then Jesus, uh, Matthew 15, 21, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. You remember where the Canaanites' land started from? Sidon, up by the, 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 the Mediterranean in the north, right? And it comes down to Gaza, over to Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's, he's going into that land, and it says in verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Israel didn't get rid of, of the Canaanites out of the land. And they're there, and even when Christ shows up, there's a woman who comes to him, and she's coming, a woman of Canaan. That issue that Israel has over in Palestine today, who do they have the issues with? It's in the land of Canaan. Oh, by the way, some of Israel's other enemies in the land were the, the Moabites and the, uh, the, the Ammonites. You know, they are also the products of incest. Lot and his daughters, after Lot got drunk. Incest. Now, I, I, I have a point here to make, is that the, um, I do have a point. There was a curse upon the descendants of Ham that lived in the land. Cursed be Canaan. What was Israel supposed to do with the land to get rid of them? They didn't. And so people have a hard time. Do you ever hear, like, have you ever heard skeptics say, well, the God of the Old Testament is so mean, he, call, he, he, he wanted uh, you know, them to, to, uh, to wipe out people from off the face of the earth. And so people have a hard time with God commanding the taking of life. But God is the giver of life, and he also requires the life of sinners today. The only difference is that not all of those in the land were to experience a natural death. 
Now you might think that that's a hard statement for me to make. My point is, is that everyone will die. You are appointed unto death. Everybody will die. But God is bringing judgment upon a rebellious, an immoral, a sinful, a cursed people. And the accusers of God who have a problem with that today only do so because they don't like the, be, the idea of being judged themselves for being a rebellious, immoral, sinful people, just like was in the land at that time. So they therefore accuse God, just like their father Satan, the accuser, they accuse God of being immoral for those actions when you see that God was judging them for their wickedness. It wasn't arbitrary. So what we find, why did God, sorry, why did Noah curse Canaan? The reason that God cursed Canaan is because Ham uncovered his father's nakedness is a reference to Noah, um, Ham having relations with Noah's wife, incest, and the offspring from that was Canaan. And so Noah cursed Canaan. And Ham's act of incest is the backdrop for the tension down through the centuries between the descendants of Ham and Canaan and the descendants of Shem. And after the flood, God sets up a governmental authority and the nations, and we find the reason right here in this book of beginnings, Genesis. We find the reason in the book of beginnings for the beginning of the conflict between the nations, Israel and Canaan. So, I, I read the note that I had made there. Now maybe let me say it in my own words verbally without reading what I had wrote down. Why is it that we have this story of Canaan being cursed in Genesis chapter number 9? We have the authority being given by God in the beginning of Genesis chapter number 9 for him to set up the nations. We have in chapter number 10 where we're going to find the descendants of Noah and they, God sets them up according to the boundaries and he, make, he makes them nations. There's some rebellion that goes on in Genesis chapter number 11 and then from there on we start dealing with Abraham. And God gives Abraham a land. And Abraham and his descendants have a conflict with the Canaanites. So what we find out from the very beginning when the nations were set up and the nations were given is God tells us why there's conflict. And God tells us who those Canaanites are, why there's a conflict. And so this little story here in Genesis chapter number 9 of why did Noah curse Canaan for what Ham did, gives you an explanation in the context for all of the tension that you find not only through the scripture, but also when you turn on your television set and you see the tension over in the West Bank and in Gaza of what happened there. All stems back to this little story that seems so odd about Noah cursing Canaan. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the truth of it. And as we study it, we know the veracity of it. We know the reliability of it. And we just see the truth of it springing off the pages, not only as we compare Scripture with Scripture, but when we look around in this world today, Lord, your word is relevant. And it's always been relevant. So help us to teach the truth of it and the truth of your Son. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.